This is a presentation I'll be giving at the Microsoft eScience workshop on October the 22nd. I want to talk about the promise of delivering a chemistry data repository for the world, what it will take, how we encourage scientists to participate. Before I start, who in the room has an ORCID? An ORCID is the social security number for scientists. I recommend you go check out the ORCID site at orchid.org and grab yourself one. This is my number. Let's talk about some new horizons. Let's map together all historical chemistry data and let's build some systems to integrate it. We can hack into online data, we can ha hack into publications, we can hack all over the place, patents, um, websites, Wikipedia, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, let's integrate chemistry and biology data and let's actually add in disease data too. And let's, then let's model whatever data we can and see if we can extract new relationships. In many cases, it's being shown that prediction can be incredibly valuable in trying to validate experiments and design of drugs, et cetera. And then once we've done this, let's make it all available on the web. Sounds like a bit of an undertaking, probably a little too much for us to, uh, to take on. Uh, it's a massive project. Uh, is it even feasible? Well, what about this? Let's consider we're going to map the world, take as many photos as we can of different places and link them all together. Then we'll let people annotate and curate the map because the crowd is all over the world. So let them mess about with quality of data and, and layering their information on it. Then we'll make it all available for free on the web. Um, we'll make it available for decision making, for example, how to get from A to B, talking about things like restaurants, um, finding places of interest, and then put it on mobile devices and give it away. Well, I think we've pretty much done that, uh, whether it's MapQuest or some other maps program. Uh, there's many ways to map the, to get around the world today, and we've done it. So is chemistry data of value? Well, yes, I think any chemist would tell you that they would love to have access to all the reference databases that are out there. And in fact, those available generate hundreds of millions of dollars or euros, whatever your preferred currency is, per year. There is actually so much data generated that could go public but actually never gets published, never goes into reference databases, but would be of value if it was available. My own experience of maybe 5% of all data generated is published. That's, that's my own data. So probably 95% has decayed on hard drives and other storage media. There is no journal of failed experiments, and it's unlikely that anyone in the publishing industry is going to publish one. Funding, funding agencies, however, are starting to demand open data. They want it available. They want to know where all the data that has been generated from their funding and how can people access it. And then scientists want funding, but they also want recognition for all their contributions. So they're willing to undertake working to make data available, but they'd also like recognition for it that is above and beyond funding. Of course, we have an enormous shift to openness in the domains of open source, in the domains of open access for publishing. And of course, open data is already more than here. There are so many projects going on where open data is insisted on at this point, and increasingly we're, we're just going to see more of this happening. So yes, while chemistry data is of value, the question really is who will fund and build the platforms? What will they look like? Because most chemists, most, most institutions, um, most educators have no idea how to build these platforms, and many of the institutions simply don't have the resources to do it. And what would be more ideal is if a community worked together to build the appropriate platforms and to support them. If you want to build these types of platforms, uh, going native, i.e. speaking the lingo of uh, chemistry is absolutely necessary. Chemists will clearly benefit from accessing data, for example, safety data, top left. We've got analytical data, spectral data on the left, bottom left, chemical structures, uh, graphs, plots. There's so many different forms of chemistry data that, that uh, need to be available. Uh, but in terms of data handling, you truly need to understand the complexity of this data type. Chemical structures should not just be images. They should be formats that can be indexed and searched. Analytical data are best to not be figures, but to be indexed and searched to form analytical databases, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, chemists will clearly benefit from accessing the data. But if you really want to figure it out, you've got to delve deeply into how to manage the complexity of these data types. We already had experience in this. We built ChemSpider, which is a database of 30 million chemicals, and we got the crowd participating in curating and annotating. And here's a record from ChemSpider uh, where we, we've made it available. In this case, searching by uh, 
text, which is the most common way to search these databases. People are searching for particular chemicals. What we found very quickly is that data quality on the internet can be very poor. Um, everyone wants to access high quality data. Uh, very few are willing to pay for it if they, if they don't have to, and very few are willing to contribute. And the primary concerns for people who do want to contribute is it needs to be easy to do so. They're concerned about data licensing and will they lose uh, control of their data and can they be recognized for contributions? And certainly for scientists, recognition means having an impact. This issue of impact of a scientist's work is very, very important. Scientists are already being measured. They're being measured on different platforms. And is it the number of impressions of their articles? Is it the number of downloads? Is it who cites their articles? Uh, there are many ways that we're already being measured, and I show some of them here. Um, but in reality, what's happening is a change in the way that scientists might be measured with something called altmetrics. And NISO have already written a white paper about these altmetrics. And there are a number of engines already showing up, including Altmetric itself, Plum Analytics, and Impact Story. And I encourage you to, to take a look at what these are. Research outputs uh, are more than just publications, and there are citations that are given to them. So people are blogging, there are research data sets, they produce software, a lot of posters and presentations, theses, dissertations, performances on YouTube, training videos, lectures, online classes. There are so many things that a scientist produces now most of which they are not measured on, and Altmetrics is trying to resolve this issue. So some of the things we, we wish we could be measured on is performing peer review. Nobody knows how much I'm doing. Nobody knows how, how hard I work in my off hours to do peer review. And what about contributions to more public platforms? Here's a typical story. I decided to spend some time over Christmas a few years ago uh, curating the chemical structures on Wikipedia, checking them, checking each atom, each bond. Uh, I was checking these chem boxes and drug boxes. The chem box is shown on the right-hand side. There are chemical structures and many identifiers below it that needed to be checked. Uh, I went to work to try and check these. As an example of checking a compound, this structure here, tacrolimus, I identified that one bond from the whole molecule representation was incorrect and got into a three-day discussion with a gentleman um, who... Uh, I argued with about the stereo detail and we finally resolved it. If you want to understand Wikipedia editing, definitely go native and get involved. Immerse yourself in it. Now, does one bond actually matter? Well, if you try and overlap your hands, you will see they're mirror images of each other. And it is possible for chemical compounds to be mirror images of each other. As an example, uh, these compounds are mirror images of each other. You can see that the bonds here are different. One is coming out of the plane and the other one is going into the plane. They are mirror images of each other. One is caraway, one is spearmint. Does that make a difference? Yes. In thalidomide, one form is teratogenic and causes the severe birth defects that we know about for thalidomide, while the other one is sleep inducing and is a sedative. What we would need to do to build these databases out and to bring all the data together is make sure that we're following standards and using as many of the appropriate uh, formatted standards for chemistry as possible. Chemists are more likely to know basic HTML than they are to know de chemistry data formats. Even international standards are basically unknown to most chemists. But standards are ideal for computers to handle. So we're building systems for everyone to validate and standardize their data. So if they provide us the data in their format, we will flag it. We will identify potential errors. We can transform the data and standardize it into the best form for, for chemical databases. In this way, we will get higher quality data online and we'll be able to get a better result from meshing data. The outcome of meshing the data will be, will be that articles will be able to have molecules linked up to them directly. So that a series of complex questions as asked on the right hand side by medicinal chemists can all be integrated. In this case, nobody wants to redraw these chemical compounds from this paper. Nobody wants to have to take the images, they, they would rather take the data and reanalyze it if possible. They'd also like to map out to other databases. This is feasible. So where would we host this research data? Well, you need to build compound containers and reaction containers, analytical data containers. It's possible to build algorithms to, to validate the data and standardize, which we're already doing for compounds and building it for reactions and analytical data. We need to build specific search technologies. 
a platform to model the data because once you've got high quality data you can build some very good models around it and we've made some good progress on doing this with the ROC data repository we've got compound containers already built reaction containers already built and containers for analytical data and we're doing a lot of work thousands of hours of discussions with scientists to figure out what they need in terms of data handling how they would like to see it mesh together how it can underpin publications and how it can support research data that never gets published when we brought together this data these data then we can build models from them and then people can simply predict some of their properties these technologies are very well proven so a lot of these new horizons are already here uh, and while I've been talking mostly about looking at historical chemistry data, things that already exist in articles, publications, patents, etc. Uh, what we need to consider is learning from this so that we start to build better solutions for modern data, so that we are producing data formats that can be consumed. So we can sit, consider semantic web solutions for a lot of these data management issues. And we're already involved in some of those data management uh, solutions. We would, we would prefer to not do this. This is a figure directly extracted from a PDF file. It is a figure. I can't reanalyze it. I can't put it into a database except as a figure. And while we can do some clever things, while we can take the original figure at the bottom and transfer it to the, transform it to the extracted figure at the top, and while we can then database that and, and rework that data, is the wrong way to do it. It's feasible, but it's the wrong way to do it. We should get the original data. The path forward is that we will mesh and aggregate it. We're going to encourage deposition of research data, that stuff that will never be published, and keep it embargoed and private if necessary. We're going to provide open APIs for data access so that people can use the data, access the data, integrate the data, start doing big data modeling if they need to. And we'll, we will certainly put work into educating chemists in digital literacy. Our hope is the funding agencies will continue to mandate the data, data access so that we can work with chemists to make sure that it happens. And we don't see ourselves as the only solution, clearly. Others need to help. Collaboration is key. We cannot do it alone, and we expect that other solutions will come to the fore. Thank you.